Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served. What you gain, you have to lose. What you lose, God brings back and redeems. What's up is down. What's down is up. That's the basic definition of this. This extraordinary upside down kingdom. We are continuing our series in uh, the book of Luke, and so if you would like to get ready for that, you can open your Bibles to Luke 17 or your flat screen devices, uh, get there. Also, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. My grandson this morning was worried that I didn't have any green, (laughs) and so he actually gave me his necklace. So thank you, CJ, for that, your kindness. It's afraid that I would get pinched all morning long if I... Came in. He didn't know that we didn't do that really, right? but uh, the, the leprechaun visited his house this morning, so he swears. But so I've got this thing going on. Also, um, yeah, just great, to, grateful to have you here in Hello Theater. Um, we are live at all our locations today, but the theater is watching me. So hi, theater. I never say hi to y'all. So hello. All right, let's pray. Let's pray, and we'll get going. God, as we start, we're mindful uh, that we're a part of a global community and that it seems that we uh, invent new ways to be cruel to each other. Um, Just this morning's news mentioned three shootings in Oakland, past shootings in New Zealand, in Christchurch. God, we ask in acts of violence, that you would come in and be comfort for people who lose their loved ones, that they would be drawn to you, that you would empower the church around these tragedies in such a way that a message of hope and of grace and of love can be extended to people who have lost. And now God is we gather in this short time, we ask that you would do something actually supernatural in us, that you would take just a few minutes and you would empower your truth in our hearts that we might be people of gratitude and that it would more mark um, how we view our lives. Use this, please, in Christ's name. Amen. Luke 17 has a very cool little short story in it that... Um, is actually this fantastic miracle. It's one of the great miracles in the New Testament that Jesus does. But the story is more about the reaction to the miracle than the miracle itself. It's actually quite amazing that you could have this great miracle, but the reaction of it is what we really, it's really the story is known for. And it's the story of the 10 lepers. Luke 17, beginning at verse 11. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, this is a great marker for us in terms of where he is. Those of you who've been coming, you can already walk your way through the book. Chapters 1 and 2 were the birth narratives of John the Baptist and Jesus. Chapters 3 through 9, he was actually in the area of Galilee. Lots of miracles, lots of establishing who he was as the Son of God. Then he's been, since the middle of chapter 9, been moving, making his way toward Towards Jerusalem, And just to show you that this is not just a literary device or some way for me to kind of help you with the book. He says that he is moving towards Jerusalem in chapter 9, chapter 13, twice, chapter 14, here in chapter 17, chapter 18 again, and five times in chapter 19. So he is moving towards Jerusalem. And at this point, he's on the border between Galilee and Samaria. So let me show you a map so you can kind of get familiar with this. Galilee is the the region to the north, northern Israel. It's up where the Sea of Galilee is, duh. In the middle, there's Samaria. And then down in the bottom is Judea. Now, Judea is where Jerusalem is. You can always find Jerusalem pretty quickly. Go to the northern tip of the Dead Sea, go left, and you'll always find Jerusalem. Now, to put this in context of how far it is, because we think, oh my gosh, this is just like, you know, it's like California. No, from the bottom southern tip of the Dead Sea to the top tip of the Sea of Galilee is 100 miles, approximately. So it's not a big region. 
And so here we go. Jesus has began his ministries up in Galilee, chapters 3 through 9. And then since the middle of chapter 9, he's been working his way down towards uh, Jerusalem and Judea. Most, most self-respecting Jews would avoid the middle section of Samaria. And so they would go out towards the river the, uh, of Gal- uh, over on the right, or they would go towards the coast and avoid that. He's somewhere on the northern edge between Galilee and Samaria. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Now, it's not unusual that lepers would gather together. They are completely ostracized to community, and so they would hang out with one another. And they stood at a distance, it says. Now, this is by law. You can imagine the fear around skin diseases and the devastation that leprosy had. Most of there were other skin diseases. They all just, they just clumped them all together. They didn't have any idea about which ones were which. Um, back then, but they just clumped them all together, and they were, no, they were just very fearful around it. Um, they saw that it had devastating effects because they didn't know what to do and what to treat it. And so there was a law that said, you can't come into the village unless you're X amount of feet away from people, and you have to announce um, as you come in with leprosy, if there's anyone within shouting distance of you, you have to announce there by this really encouraging statement, unclean! unclean you would walk around and if you saw anybody off unclean and if you got too close they'd throw rocks at you and it was in, within their right to do that they would just there was such fear and such a such a separation from the community that you were removed from everybody that you loved and all of these kinds of things so these folks they would hang out together and it says in verse 13 they called out in a loud voice Jesus Master. Now, they're not in community, so I, we don't know how they knew his name. That's pretty interesting. Shows you how famous Jesus is by the time you get to 17. Um, but he, they also say, they call him Master. Now, this is interesting because in the book of Luke, no one calls Jesus Master except one of the 12 apostles. Nobody else. This is the only time in the whole book that anybody else other than an apostle calls Jesus Master. It's this idea of, of calling, placing themselves in a position of subordination under Jesus, expecting that he could do something about their, their situation if he chooses to. And this is what they ask. Have pity on us. Pity is a very rare word in Luke. It's only used three other times. Have pity on us. Not mercy. Pity. Verse 14, when Jesus saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, that's a weird response, right? He doesn't say, oh, you know, be healed or be clean or, yeah, I feel. In Luke chapter 5, he heals a leper and he goes over and he actually touches him, which no one would have ever done. He touches them and heals them. He doesn't say anything these days. They're off at a distance yelling and he's like, all right, go show yourselves to the priest. What is that? Well, this is what it is. What the lepers would have heard is, you are clean. Go and show yourselves to the priest. Legally, according to the laws of skin diseases, they would have had to have gone to the priest and then shown themselves to the, to the priest and say, we are clean now, we've been healed. Reinstate us into community. Allow us to be able to come back and go see our families. Allow us to be able to come back into the villages. It's, it's, a, it's a reuniting of community in, in for them. And so it's all they ever wanted. It sounds like a weird thing for us, but for them it was like everything. Go and show yourselves to the priest. By the way, there's all kinds. There's two chapters in the scriptures devoted to just this whole um, recognition of skin diseases and then the reestablishment of them if, if they get clean. In Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, if you wanted to see what the Hebrew scriptures, what Moses' law had said about these folks. Here we go. As they went, they were cleansed. Now, don't you wish you had more than that? As they went, they were cleansed. Like... Immediately, like one at a time, like slowly, like glowing. Did they glow? I mean, what happened? We don't know. As they're going, they're cleansed. And one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back and he does three things. Praising God in a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet, 
and thanked him. Praising God with a loud voice. He's been yelling his whole life. His whole leprosy life. Unclean! Unclean! Now he gets to holler something different. And he falls, he prostrates, he takes a position of worship at the feet of Jesus and acknowledges God as the healer. And then he thanks him. Now I want to spend some time right here because this word is a super unique word and it comes from a family of words that um, are very meaningful for us. This is the word Eucharist or Eucharisteo. And it's a word that Jesus uses at the Last Supper in Luke 22 when he blesses the meal and gives thanks for it. It's this word. It's also the word Eucharist that we call communion or the Lord's Supper. It means to give thanks. Good gift, literally. Good gift. To give thanks. It comes from a root word, charis, which means grace. Now, you actually already knew this. When you gather around the table and you're going to bless the meal, you say grace. You call it the praying for the meal, saying grace, or giving thanks. You get this idea, um, kara, which is another word that's a root word here, is joy. So you've got, it's a gift that brings joy When you put a little prefix on it, it means good gift or to give thanks. When you pray around your meals, you probably probably rarely say grace, but you give, you say grace. That's what we call it. You actually knew the root of this word without even knowing you knew the word. See? (laughs) This is an amazing thing that goes on here, and it establishes this pattern. Jesus then will take and give thanks at the at the communion table of the Last Supper, and now we, it, it stands now as one of the two things, word pictures that w- Jesus left us that we do on a regular basis when we gather. We practice Eucharist. We give thanks. It says that he was a Samaritan. Wouldn't be unusual. They were on the border of Galilee and Samaria. Jesus asked, We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? The word there for foreigner, only time used in the Bible, in the New Testament, only time. It's actually a little bit derogatory. It's used on purpose to bring shame to the the others that did not respond with thanksgiving. Then he said to him, Rise and go forth. Your faith has made you well. This same statement, your faith has made you well, is three other times, Luke 7 and 8, and then after this chapter in 18, and it transla- can be translated, your faith has saved you. All ten were healed. Only nine comes back and gives thanks. Now, a couple of things about gratitude. Let's, I'm going to spend the rest of our time just thinking about gratitude and how important it is. I, I come up with a definition for it. It's my own definition, and it's, it's fresh. So I always like finding somebody else's definition and giving them to you, but this is what I got right now. Gratitude is thankfulness for the way things are with a sense of hope for how they will be. Gratitude is... See, gratitude can't be... It can't be stopped just because things go poorly because we're told to be grateful all the, all the time. And so gratitude is a sense of thankfulness for the way things are with a hope of how they will be. A couple other things about gratitude. First, it's rare. It's very rare. It's one in ten. It's one in ten. Two, Gratitude not only recognizes the gift, but the giver of the gift. It sees the the giver of the gift. And it's also both an attitude and an action. See, we have a a saying that perhaps I've even taught before. You have to have have an attitude of gratitude, right? Well, that doesn't get you there, folks. You got to also practice gratitude. So it's, it's both an attitude and an action. I will tell you this. All ten lepers were thankful to be healed. 
All 10 were thankful to be healed, but only one practiced gratitude and actually came back. Now, here's the amazing thing about it. We're commanded all over the New Testament to, to be thankful and to have gratitude. But it's another one of those genius of Jesus. Jesus is actually asking us to do what we most want inside. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm really thankful for Brene Brown and her book, The Gift of Imperfections. And in that, she says, in her thousands of people study on emotional health, she said that gratitude is the foundational necessary ingredient for every person they, she's ever met that she would characterize that has as a life of joy. No one has joy without gratitude. It's, it's, it's a prerequisite. It's required. Now, joy, we all want joy. In fact, I've told you before in the front of all, every journal that I have, I have four things. What I really want in life, some things that go on, and the fourth thing that I want is a life of joy. And Jesus is saying that the best way to get there is to practice, not just have an attitude, but to practice gratitude. Now, what's so good about that? Well, Brene Brown, again, says that there's four really great things about gratitude. One, it allows us to celebrate the present. It magnifies the goodness of what we're in right now. To just stop and think of what is happening for you is really an opportunity to magnify and, and enjoy the moment more. I mean, this, this is a silly gift to all of you. And it looks stupid on a grown man with no hair. <laughs> but it's just a chance for me to magnify the goodness in my life that I have. Secondly, it, the gratitude blocks toxic emotions. <laughs> Brene Brown says this. She says, if you practice gratitude, it's impossible to be envious or have resentment or regret. That, that if, if you are in an attitude of gratitude and practicing it, that it gets rid of these toxic kinds of emotions that, bear, that kind of slow us down from being the people we want. Great, grateful people are also more stress resilient. The finding is, is that people are actually, you got any stress in your life? It's a characteristic of the valley. It's what you, you actually get inoculated. Stress. You just get it when you come here. If you live here, you got it. You want to be more stress resilient? You think that how to fix that is just to get more vacation or work less hours. It's actually to be more be, have more gratitude. And then gratitude strengthens social ties. This is just a behavioral way of saying nobody likes being around people who don't practice gratitude. Nobody likes being around people that it's all about them or they're all pessimistic. This narcissism and pessimism that is, we're, we, we are told and we understand marks the culture that we are in today. Gratitude moves you against that. People like being around people that are thankful. And it just so happens that we are commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you. So I want to take an opportunity in, in our time here, and this is just to practice gratitude together. And it's going to be a little uncomfortable. You'll have to keep up over there at the theater because I'm not in that room, and you, it'll seem a little weird. But we're going to just do some things where we're going to pray some things and, and practice gratitude. And then we will collectively together practice Eucharist. We've arranged the month in such a way where we could have communion on this week. All right, let's pray together, and I'll walk you through this. So as we start, as we bow our heads, if you're comfortable with this, just begin to allow your mind to be flooded with things that you are thankful for. It doesn't matter if it's silly like a plastic necklace or things like family, just as many things as you can just begin to flood into your mind, just things that you are thankful for. And don't get caught on just one, just continue to move over and over to as many things as you can kind of name that you are grateful for. The practice of gratitude is four words. I am grateful for 
and you fill in the blank. Now, some of you are tripped up right now because you began to list some things and then you began to have thoughts coming into your mind about things that you're, you're worrying about and you're anxious for. And Philippians chapter 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You see, gratitude is a a thankfulness for how things are, but also a hope of how they will be. And you can't let worry stop your gratitude. Present that worry as just an opportunity to be thankful. Present that barrier to gratitude as something that God can work and do great things through. And now others of you, about now or maybe even before now, you've already begun to think about the things you have to do. The lists that are making demands on you in the next 20 minutes or in the next 24 hours or in the next two weeks. All that is in front of you. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. You cannot allow your busyness to pull you out of gratitude. So as those lists and, and to-dos and things that you have to get done, as they kind of pop in your mind, you can actually, whatever you do in word or deed, I mean, that pretty much covers it. You can, with gratitude, lay those things also at Jesus' feet with a sense of hope of how he's going to work. Now, just using different parts of my body to give thanks to God. God, we are grateful for you moving towards us. Thankful that you are not a God that is sitting far off, but you're one who moves and walks alongside us every single day, every moment you are present with us. God, we are grateful that we have felt your touch. Thank you for being present in our life and holding our hand through our fears. Jesus, thank you for taking the nails in your hands on our behalf. But I also thank you that it was not the nails, but in truth, it was the love you had for us that held you to that cross. A love for the whole world. Thank you. And God, I am grateful for your heart for us. Thank you that we are called your beloved and that we are the apple of your eye, that the plans that you have for us are for good and not for evil. Thank you that your love extends to us even in our worst moments 
and that love compelled you to act on our behalf. And that forgiveness is ours in Jesus. And God, we are grateful that you you see us personally, individually. You know us by name. You, You see us completely and accurately and you still love us unconditionally. Thank you, God. Thank you. And Father, we are grateful that you hear our prayers and our cries that call out to you and that your ear is always attentive to listen to us. That you hear our our spoken and unspoken words even now. I'm grateful for the spoken word that you have left us. Thank you that you did not leave us without clear instruction on what it means uh, to know you and to live for you. And God, we are grateful for your wisdom. It is completely right and beautiful. May, May you teach us your ways that we may know your truth and your clear message of love for us and the whole world. And Father, as we come to this table, communion table, the Eucharist, we come with gratitude. We thank you for what the elements represent, the good news of your love for us and our total acceptance and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Hi, welcome to your Westgate details. Unfortunately, I will not be able to deliver this week's important message. I just don't have the power, the importance, the the gravitas, the je ne sais quoi, the I don't know what. So we're gonna have to call someone else in, someone with rugged good looks and raging testosterone. Okay, beautiful day is next weekend and Clifford's up on the video. So you know what that means? This is the heavy, this is the hammer. We need you to sign up. Some of y'all been waiting, we get it. It's the Westgate way, you're just kind of waiting till the last minute. Well, the last minute is now here. We need you to sign up. We're still um, quite a bit short in terms of the volunteers needed as we extend ourselves out to the city. Now help us out. No matter what, whether you're a skilled laborer or, or have no skills at all, or you feel like, you know what, I can't really do anything. I don't have a lot of, of, of stuff that I can bring. We can use everyone in some capacity. Please sign up for Beautiful Day this weekend, and then let's go serve the city. Okay, final two things. No services next weekend on the 23rd and 24th. Um, if you show up here, we will not be here. Come and serve with us. Also, after the service, Sign up on the app, sign up online, or better still, go out to a table, help, let them help you get signed up on the service project you want to be a part of. Okay. Well, now that that's done, we'd also like to remind you that the night after Beautiful Day on that Sunday night, we're going to have a celebration dinner just to get together, celebrate what happened this past weekend, and also just share stories. There's also going to be a taco truck. So make sure and sign up for that too. From all of us to all of you, these have been your Westgate details, and I'd like to remind you to sign up for a beautiful day because Steve is a man with a particular set of skills, and he will find you. If you've been around here long, you're still wondering what that particular set of skills is. What exactly do you do well? And we're still wondering how that would be. Listen, if you would like to lean into this idea of gratitude at a deeper level, um, one of the best resources I know is this book called 1,000 Gifts by a gal named Ann Voskamp. 1,000 Gifts, they even have a, a little journal and workbook to go along with it. This, if you really want to lean into this, 
David, you said you do, then this would be a fantastic place to start. Very, very good resource. Um, okay, I think. Um, now, the application for um, this whole um, gratitude thing really is this. See, we, we do Beautiful Day because it's, we really do it out of an act of obedience. We think it's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, that we would love our neighbor. Uh, but we also do it because we need it. We need the opportunity to recognize what God has given us, be grateful, and go and serve others. And so um, I would just say to you, there are many of you who have been waiting to sign up. It's what you do. By the way, just a little secret. You're doing better signing up than we've ever done better than ever by quite some time, some multipliers. But there are still many of you, and we know this, there are many of you who are like, you, you know, you keep your options open. You want to see for sure if it's going to rain or not. Get signed up today, please. There's a team of people, a large team of people that have been working for over eight months to put these projects together, and they sit at home and fret over whether these projects are going to get done. So go ahead and sign up and put their hearts to rest so that they can live a week of gratitude as well, okay? Get signed up, please. You can do it right now. If you go out at the tables, they've actually got the, the, all of the projects listed and they can tell you which ones need the most help. If you can't figure out which one you wanna be in, come join me at that Morgan Hill Home Improvement. That'll be great. Let's stand together. Now I think I've said everything. I wanna send you out with the, the famous St. Patrick prayer. By the way, when you think St. Patrick as a believer, don't think leprechauns and, and you know, four-leaf clovers. Think one of the greatest effective missionaries in the history of the church. This is what he said. This is his prayer. Christ beside me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. And Christ within me. Christ beneath me and Christ above me. May you know that everywhere you go, Christ is right there with you. Be people of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming.